interest for our students. OK, Max, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I will briefly maybe put the camera on I, uh, just to, to um, you know, get a better better connection, uh, emotional connection also with the audience. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, we get all we all get used to this now, I think, uh, uh, speaking uh, into the void from your from the comfort of your own office and your coffee coffee brewer in the corner and so on. So so but still, uh, of course, nothing is compares to to be there in person and to to uh, see the reactions and the and uh, be able to sense a bit better the communication. But we do, do what we have to do. So it's practical, don't have to travel. So that's also good. So I'm very honored and uh, privileged to be able to join you tonight and to, to, um, to speak a little bit about um, what the European Union and the Commission specifically does in the, in the area of research and specifically then space research. So I will. Uh, give a little bit overview of the coming program, only a few slides on uh, Horizon Europe and the space program, but uh, we'll devote most of the time to Horizon 2020 uh, and what we do there in space, uh, specifically in technology. So I work in the relatively new uh, Directorate General called the uh, DEFIS, which uh, stands for Defense Industry and Space. So it's a, it's a, we only have three directorates, one uh, dealing with defense, uh, research, uh, one dealing with uh, space uh, research, we can say, and the third one dealing more with space policy and, uh, and the space programs, uh, Galileo and Copernicus in particular. So, um, so we are, uh, as I said, relatively new. Our director general is uh, a Finnish gentleman, Timo uh, Pesonen, and we have uh, just appointed a few directors also in our uh, DG just recently. So our director in Directorate B, where I work, is uh, Catherine Cavada. Maybe some of you who have been involved in Galileo satellite navigation uh, know her already. And uh, we have uh, uh, Matthias Petschke in, in, the, in the Directorate dealing with space policy and Galileo. And uh, now for defense, I don't know who's the director. I don't remember exactly, to be honest. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but uh, it's all quite fresh. And um, uh, I will, uh, as I said, I will start. I hope, uh, first of all, um, uh, please tell me if the, if the voice is too low or too high, or if, uh, you know, if the audio quality goes out well. To me, it sounds really good. It's okay. very good quality, and we also yeah. see your slides well, uh, Matt. Okay, very good, very good. So let's see then. Okay, now I see I cannot change my slide, which is, of course, a pity. Now, here. Okay, so a quick look at Horizon Europe, which is now the, as uh, as Professor Lapas just mentioned, uh, is um, something that keeps us very busy this autumn, and especially these days now before the end of the year we have meetings with the member states in committees we are working on updates of the work program uh, without actually knowing the budget which is a problem so um, you those of you who follow the eu scene know that the member states have not yet agreed fully on the on the budget for 2021 2027 specifically then for next year which there will not which will could have the effect that we will not be able to launch the program in time. But uh, OK, usually there is a solution somewhere to be found. So uh, first, uh, a few words about uh, there's something called EU space program. You're all quite familiar, I suppose, with Galileo, uh, EGNOS satellite navigation and Copernicus Earth observation program. Uh, the, they are based uh, on uh, Basically, they are based on uh, research. Uh, this was funded by research program previously in previous incarnation and are now operational programs in their own right in, uh, in uh, of course, in very tight and uh, strong cooperation with the European Space Agency and uh, national space agencies. Uh, European Space Agency is implementing uh, uh, the program, one can say, in, in terms of technology, certainly. We have some, uh, uh, so those, so those 
programs, Galileo and Copernicus, together with uh, two new elements, SSA, Govs.com, are now uh, bundled together in one program called the EU Space Program. SSA stands for uh, Space Survey, Space Situational Awareness, and the main component there is space uh, surveillance and tracking to keep keep track of space debris, for instance. Uh, but there is also uh, work on space weather and near-Earth objects in this program. Uh, Govsatcom is governmental secure satellite communication. And this is all supported by, of course, by uh, activities in access to space or the launchers, uh, specific support to start up uh, small companies and uh, important work on uh, security of these systems. Um, so the, what I just mentioned is the EU space program. It's of course an operational program. Uh, it's funding. It is funding. Uh, uh, well, it's not yet a program. I, I just mentioned the budget is not yet decided, but uh, it's in the order of 15 billion euro, and uh, will fund the operation of these uh, activities and of course the launch of the satellites uh, in the constellations that need to be launched still. And um, uh, on the contrary, for the future versions of these systems, the upgrades, uh, the research budget is uh, used. And uh, uh, Horizon Europe is, uh, as you probably know, the next program for starting from next year. It's a bit similar to Horizon 2020, a very large program covering almost every field of research. And there are three elements, uh, a more science-oriented element, a more industrially-oriented element, and an, a, a close-to-market element, uh, the Pillar 3, where, where we support also small companies and uh, startups, uh, as well as uh, bigger companies as well. Um, if you look at Pillar 2 specifically, there are a number of so-called clusters. Uh, health, culture, creativity, inclusive society, civil security for society, digital industry and space, uh, climate, energy, mobility, food, bioeconomy, agriculture, etc. In the digital industry and space, as you can imagine, the ICT program is there, uh, industrial uh, research activities are there, in, for example, manufacturing factories of the future, these kind of things and the space research. So, um, so you can see the ten different uh, intervention areas that were part of the Commission's original proposal, and you one of those areas is space. We don't know, uh, of course, the budget yet, but the Commission's proposals were was in the order of 100 billion for the whole program for the seven years. Uh, of which uh, about uh, 15 billion is for our cluster. So digital industry and space would have around 15 billion for seven years. Um, uh, the exact distribution between the different in, uh, intervention areas is not yet decided. And the final budget for the cluster uh, is also not uh, yet decided, but we have good hope that it will be in this range. Um, so we don't know what the space budget will be, basically, that's the result. We have some ideas, and one of the ideas is to, to, to uh, assume that we will get something similar to Horizon 2020 with a little top-up, but uh, again, this needs to be confirmed. Mm, Horizon Europe space program is split so the space research program in Horizon Europe, we have, of course, prepared a lot already. We have a draft work program, um, and uh, we have built that by having a, two years of uh, consultation activities with uh, stakeholders, as it's called. So the space industry, the space research establishments, the space agencies, including European Space Agency, and of course also listening to the uh, users and uh, and uh, the end users and intermediate users, so to say, of the of Galileo and Copernicus. 
I'm bringing that all together in in the, in the as we see three different blocks here. One block, if you start on the right upper half, you have the EU space program components. So clearly, there is a responsibility for the research uh, program to support uh, the uh, the operational activities in the space program, uh, support with research for the future generations. So we talk here about the evolution of space and ground infrastructure for EGNSS, so um, Galileo and EGNOS, about evolution and services and development of applications for the for that program and for Copernicus program. And uh, then also to develop the new new elements of the operational programs, uh, as I mentioned before, SSA, GovSatcom, but also quantum uh, communication which is uh, essential for GovSatcom, for example. Plus one element uh, linked more to supporting and uh, fostering entrepreneurship in this area. We call this uh, activity uh, Cassini, funded partially from, from the, uh, the EU space program and partially from Horizon Europe space. On the left hand side, you see what we call upstream space. Uh, well, I mean, it's not evolution of space and ground infrastructure for EGNSS, of course, is upstream as well. Uh, this has traditionally in uh, the last framework programs been delegated to European Space Agency, and it's likely to happen even this time, although negotiations are still ongoing. Uh, but the other uh, areas not related directly to Galileo, we we, we uh, put them together in two different blocks. One is competitiveness of space systems, uh, which mainly is concerned uh, with the satellite systems, also ground systems, and uh, reinforcement of our capacity to access and use space, which is uh, focusing on uh, launchers, launcher technology for traditional conventional launchers, but also for small launchers. And in addition to all this, we have the, uh, the block at the bottom addressing uh, critical technologies for non-dependence, in-orbit demonstration validation, synergies with other parts of, uh, of the framework program, specifically for high-performance computing, artificial intelligence, uh, which is of course very important for space, but most of the activities happen in the ICT program. Uh, space science, uh, education and skills, and uh, international cooperation. So, so all this together will be the Horizon Europe space part, but uh, again, it's quite ambitious. We don't know yet if we will have the budget to, to uh, do all that, but uh, that's, uh, uh, there will be some trade-offs for sure. But the, anyway, these, these are the main blocks and we will work on all these blocks in Horizon Europe. I think that concluded my um, very short introduction in, into Horizon Europe, the next program. Um, so uh, now about Horizon 2020. So we had a, um, a uh, uh, we have a program which we can put schematically a bit uh, like like you see here on this slide. Three main blocks which align nicely with the European uh, Space Strategy, uh, which was published in 2016, I believe, and, uh, and it has been developed uh, with, with, with the help of all European uh, countries and stakeholders involved. But this Space Strategy, of course, is quite broad and high level, doesn't go into detail. Uh, here we, we address uh, the main priority lines, which is maximizing benefits for space, society and economy. These are mainly support to the operational programs, Earth Observation, Copernicus uh, and EGNSS and satellite navigation with market uptake and, serve and uh, new applications. And also with uh, for Copernicus, the evolution of the operational services, and for EGNSS, uh, infrastructure development and uh, mission and services evolution also there. Also one block uh, related to support to 
space hubs, so outreach and education, and general support for uh, uh, SMEs and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have a price, an inducement price on low cost space launch, for example, here. And there is a, what is called Innofin Space Equity Pilot, which is a, an effort together with the European um, Investment Bank to, uh, to let's say, uh, de-risk um, uh, by putting public money into the pot and allow uh, the European Investment Bank, European Investment Fund to, uh, to launch space funds, so to say. Uh, basically, they, they uh, provide investment opportunities for uh, uh, venture capital companies and networks. Okay, that's the first uh, pillar. Uh, so pillar in the middle, this is maybe the focus of today, is the related to space technology and space science. Uh, so tech, we'll come to these uh, different subheadings later, technology for European non-dependence and competitiveness. We have specific research clusters, as we call them. We address generic space technologies, specifically Earth observation and SATCOM, in-orbit validation demonstration, and then a few science topics. And on the right side, you see access to space and secure and safe space environment. So the activities related to uh, launchers, launcher technology, and activities related then to the SSA, space uh, surveyors, space situational awareness, um, uh, consisting of space weather research, near Earth object, and uh, space surveillance, space traffic management, and secure satellite communication. So this. You know, if nothing else, um, this is the most important slide in the presentation, I would say, which gives a, in one slide the overview of what we address and uh, in, in this area. Then there are a number of other actions and, and, uh, and uh, activities which, as I mentioned, were delegated uh, to European Space Agency uh, in specifically for EGNSS or Galileo infrastructure research and for in-orbit uh, validation and demonstration activity, which we launched together with ESA. Um, okay, a little bit about the budget. We had almost 1.5 billion in uh, Horizon 2020. So this, as I mentioned previously, gives an idea of where we should land, or at least we should not be lower than that in Horizon Europe. Um, and the split between the different areas uh, that were just mentioned, you see here on this uh, pie chart. So Galileo Egnos has about 30%, Copernicus about 16%, and, uh, and we have uh, space technology, which is basically 20% uh, uh, plus uh, some other elements as well. Um, access to space, perhaps nine, so 26%, something like that. Um, we have science and exploration, 4%, space weather, NEO, 2%, and then S the SST, space surveys and tracking, 8%, um, and some other activities as well. So if we, if we now go a little bit more into detail on the various uh, bits and pieces of this, um, I will first, in the form of a few pie charts, I will try to describe which areas are, are addressed and with uh, how much effort, so to say. So all in all, for space technologies, we have uh, uh, funded about 120 projects with the, in the order of 340 million euro over the seven years. Uh, there were activities in space robotics, and electric propulsion, which accounted for almost, uh, well, a bit more than 30%. As so you see, uh, we had the critical technologies, which uh, were, were uh, uh, which I will talk about later, with almost 100 million. We have Earth, Earth observation technologies, access to space, and SATCOM technologies, with roughly 10% each. And we have a generic technology line, which had about 7% in total, IOD, IOV, 1%. So uh, that gives the overall kind of split for the technology part of the program here. 
I do not include eGNSS since that technology development was uh, externalized or delegated to ESA within the order of 240 million, if I remember well. So that should be added to this. We get in the order of 600 million in total for technology development. Right, so Earth observation technology. So, uh, sorry, this is not technology. This is Earth observation um, services and uh, and uh, and uh, service evolution and uh, also um, I think applications. No, yes, applications. So uh, land monitoring, marine monitoring, climate change, uh, atmosphere, emergency, and security. You have the different blocks here. And uh, these are, you know, without going into detail here, uh, the operational services are run by uh, different agencies around, around Europe, so-called entrusted entities. And the research uh, projects in these areas are intended to support uh, those operational services. And very often the entrusted entity, for example, uh, ECMWF, so European Center for ECM medium and uh, medium medium range weather forecasts or something like this, uh, located in the UK, uh, is is um, entrusted entity for climate monitoring, climate research, and climate service. So they are very often, of course, involved in these projects, but not always. These are uh, research projects uh, open to any entity that can apply. Okay, so that's Earth Observation, uh, Copernicus, uh, Downstream Service Evolution and System Improvements. We come now to um, protection of European assets in space and from space. We have 150 million in total, mainly focusing on the space surveillance and tracking. And uh, But we also have uh, some activities on space weather research, near Earth object, as you can see, some specific uh, topics on space debris mitigation and satellite communication and space traffic management. I would say Gov's, GovSat comments, space traffic management are just starting now towards the end of Horizon 2020, but will be more important in Horizon Europe. Um, science and exploration. There is an element here, but half of the budget, which is not very large compared to the other pieces, but it's about 55 million in total but half of which are devoted is devoted to scientific instrumentation and technologies enabling space science and exploration so these are more technology development uh, activities the the left hand side heliophysics solar system exploration and astrophysics and ground facilities sample curation are more linked to observation observational science so to say uh, exploitation of data of scientific data uh, often uh, collected than in European missions, but sometimes in international missions with European uh, cooperation. So uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, and then we have the business part of uh, of the activities. We have uh, 19 million in total on projects, uh, but this does not include this SME instrument, which is a significant. Uh, funding in Horizon 2020 for uh, smaller companies, for SMEs. And uh, there, another 50 million or so was spent of uh, the space budget. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this give, that gave the over, general overview, I think, of the main areas that are addressed and uh, with how much budget and effort. So I don't know now, um, in the in the interest of time, I will uh, cut the rest of the presentation a bit short, so I will have to skip over a few slides rather quickly, but they are in the presentation and uh, can be uh, interesting to consult for uh, reference later on, perhaps. So, um, uh, well, first of all, outreach, of course, is important. Communication and success stories, we have a number of examples here of what can be considered success stories. What success stories, of course, is a very subjective concept. Um, and there are many, many more successful projects than these here. 
But just to mention that there are uh, there have been a number of um, of articles in Nature and uh, other areas. We have also an important um, repository called Cordis, where all the research projects and the results are are available uh, for for uh, download uh, reports and so on. I will give the link at the very end of the talk. Um, so space technology, science and exploration the components are satellite communication, critical space technologies, Earth observation, generic technologies, strategic research clusters and access to space. And, uh, and we'll start with critical technologies. So, uh, and those of you who are involved in defense, who are from the military side, will already know this, of course. We rely on space and defense um, uh, applica for applications of high economic strategic value, including safety and security of its citizens. Now, the problem is that we are, one of the problems, of course, is the current situation in the world in general is very interconnected, and that's good. We have a lot of collaboration. It means also that Europe is not particularly independent. Uh, we cannot be. We, we do rely on, of course, on uh, on um, uh, non-European technology for everything we do. Uh, but there are some critical areas where we perhaps should try to reduce this dependency. And this is where we um, put some effort for here in this particular part of, of our program. So some critical space technologies where we need unrestricted access. Um, this does not necessarily mean that it has to be made in Europe. It could mean that we have uh, we have uh, more than one source we can buy both from Japan and and United States or Korea and uh, and Taiwan. Who knows? So so then we have multiple sources. We have rel have relatively good idea uh, that or reasonably safe supply, so to say. But uh, sometimes you have um, export restrictions, which makes it difficult to. Uh, to uh, use this technology in in some cases, and we don't know exactly how the technology works inside. So, uh, so in those areas, we need to spend some money. We have put together a task force with European Defence Agency and European Space Agency with the Commission. Uh, we have been working together since 2009 in order to try to uh, provide lists of technologies that need where investment is needed. So to map critical technologies that suffer from these dependencies uh, from uh, third third uh, country technology, and uh, and then as a result of that to identify the areas where most urgent uh, intervention in terms of funding research funding is is needed. Um, so uh, this shows uh, the, what we have done in the Horizon 2020 in this area. Uh, with almost 100 million euro, we have funded 29 projects. See the acronyms there, of course, it's not uh, so nothing to memorize. The pie chart gives an idea that uh, uh, microelectronics, onboard data systems, and triple E components are uh, about half of the effort, but also optics, optoelectronics, structures, materials, processes, power, propulsion, etc., etc are addressed with uh, with research projects and you see uh, roughly the distribution in the pie chart and in the table um, i will move ahead uh, now comes a, a number of slides and that comes back for every new section where each project is listed in this timeline of course this uh, we don't have time to go into detail but maybe to look at the right hand side here you see the different technology lines that have been identified in this process uh, with the European Space Agency, European Defence Agency and, and the Commission. Uh, for example, space qualification of low shock non-explosive actuators, uh, thermal control systems, propellant related activities, uh, advanced materials, fibre optics, uh, power amplification, cost effective uh, solar cells for space applications, uh, signal processing uh, uh, components, etc. So these are all FPGAs, a very important area where Europe, uh, I come with a specific slide on that. 
uh, and you see there are a number of these areas and there are a number of projects that address these areas in addition to activities also funded in the in the ESA programs European Space Agency programs uh, te technology development programs so uh, together we try to to address this this issue and put specific uh, uh, research funding available for for this so uh, I will scroll through here. Uh, so I mentioned FPGAs. So these are, of course, an important topic and it's been supported by uh, EU since 2015 in a number of projects and contributed to uh, to um, development of space qualification of the whole family of FPGAs. There is a strong cooperation and synergy with EU uh, between EU ESA and uh, French activities in CNES. And uh, there has been a success story achieved with China, actually, showing uh, interest in uh, European FPGAs as alternative to American monopoly in this area. And uh, Europe sold uh, this uh, such components then to, to China last year to be embarked on Chinese uh, constellations, space constellations, space uh, satellite constellations. Uh, so, uh, also Europe, of course, uses this, uh, these components. Now, generic space technologies uh, covers, as the, as the word indicates, uh, generic uh, technologies could be power, pro power uh, electronics or power systems, uh, structures and thermal materials processes, triply components again, communication. So you see there is a certain uh, similarity to the critical technologies. The difference is that while the critical technologies that we address are only those where there is a problem of dependency, uh, this area is open to any other technology as well, which could be good to have a better, where we need better technology. I mean, maybe the best technology that we even can buy from the United States is not good enough, so we need to work on it ourselves. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, so, in general, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, in general, this this uh, uh, technologies are are considered important also for commercial commercial reasons. We need maybe we have the technology. We need to make a more cost effective uh, solution. So here we here we go. Uh, the rel relatively modest funding, though, uh, 26 million. 20 projects and mainly in the beginning of the horizon uh, 2020 you see from the last call there was in 2018. So um, uh, and also here we have clearly a number of projects positioned uh, across this timeline on communication, triple E components, materials, microelectronics, structures, power and uh, and we have a couple of examples here as well on metamaterials based optical solar reflectors. But uh, again, I think it it's, uh, would take too much time to go into detail. Um, Earth observation technology here, uh, we can say uh, in Europe, most of the technology development around Earth observation has been done in the context of ESA programs and uh, and in uh, you know in in the usual ESA context, we have complemented a bit uh, with some specific technologies related to onboard data processing, high-speed data chain, uh, some disruptive technology projects, uh, instruments and systems, and advanced SAR, uh, so synthetic aperture radar technologies. Um, and about 15 projects in total. Um, again here, similarly to previous uh, blocks, we have a number of projects. You see the acronym and the title, just to give an idea of uh, what is funded more concretely. Uh, competitive remote sensing instruments and system, uh, disruptive technologies for remote sensing, advanced SAR, onboard data processing, etc. Um, satellite communication technology is another block of course. Here we again also have 
a number of uh, areas that have been addressed over the years uh, with 36 million euro in 12 different projects and um, uh, addressing photonics, optical laser links, uh, KAKU band uh, uh, or beyond the KAKU band, digital processing, broadband antennas, small platforms, ground system technologies, security, etc. And uh, most uh, latest here in the this year's call, we funded uh, the project that you see most on the right hand side. I don't know if this mouse works, but uh, yeah, these these four projects addressing, uh, for example, uh, uh, quantum communication, the Quango. So um, and many of these projects are still ongoing, of course. Um, one example that can be mentioned is QV lift uh, that developed RF, so radio frequency components for using QV band in future broadband systems. This is necessary for for uh, very high throughput satellites. So this was uh, a successful project with a demonstration in in a satellite. So on orbit is AlphaSat, uh, which is a large ESA in Marsat, I believe, cooperation. Uh, we have two specific technology areas which we addressed in what we call strategic research cluster. One was electric propulsion and the other one space robotics. So in, uh, in Horizon 2020, this was uh, about 115 million in total um, with 35 projects and the uh, what is then a strategic research cluster? Well, it's simply a collection of projects that are that result from calls that have been programmed according to some kind of roadmap. So uh, the projects uh, and the different calls over time uh, are programmed, uh, you know, according to the roadmap, so they make sense together. And the projects in each call as well are uh, diversified in such a way as to cover what needs to be covered. So it's a kind of a, you can call it a program, a mini program. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, details uh, can be left out here, but just to say that we had a, a number of calls for, uh, for technology building blocks and for applications. And the, in the space robotics arena, uh, this will, uh, yield hopefully towards 2025, 2026 or so, an on-orbit demonstration of uh, of uh, on-orbit operation. So, could be a, a, a assembly task in 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 orbit uh, using robotics technology then developed in this in this uh, program. Uh, I will skip this slide. Electric propulsion, a bit similar. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, technologies developed in the projects for uh, low power electric propulsion to high power electric propulsion. And uh, I, for in both in both of these clusters, we have what we call a programmatic or program support activity. This is a a project which uh, includes uh, which is under ESA coordination and includes other space agencies, national space agencies from five to seven countries in Europe, and who, who is responsible for exactly the road mapping and the planning to make sure that this uh, comes to some kind of uh, useful result in the end and uh, with, a, with a demonstration activity. Um, uh, one of the examples can be given here is uh, Keops, um, which uh, developed the whole effect thruster in three power ranges, low power <clears throat> for low earth orbit applications and constellations, medium power for geo transfer orbit, I suppose, so, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, me medium earth orbit navigation systems and high power for uh, space transportation, you know, uh, interplanetary uh, space transportation. 
uh, and exploration. So um, uh, this is an example of, of uh, these technologies. And the, in the current call, these uh, three technology lines are being further developed. Um, I want to mention then access to space. Again, a very complicated picture with many projects, but the main idea here is that we address technologies as well as systems. And, uh, and we also address issues like reusability and manufacturing issues. Um, and uh, some many of the projects deal with uh, uh, low-cost launch systems for smaller satellites and uh, and uh, the manufacturing challenges that come with uh, building uh, small satellites and uh, small launchers. Um, uh, we could, uh, okay, I think that's enough, 12 projects, 36 million. There was also, we should mention, an SME instrument funding for micro launchers. I think uh, Professor Lapas can tell you more about some of these activities at least. Uh, we also have a prize, we, prize uh, as I mentioned previously, an um, horizon price, inducement price for the, the low-cost space launch for the consortium or company that man manages to pr produce the technology that will enable cost-effective launches of, launches of small satellites. Uh, right, I think we will uh, skip this one. Um, okay, what I what was not mentioned here, which was alluded to in the title slide, was uh, in-orbit demonstration and validation. So this is an activity that we we work on together with ESA in order to prepare, uh, hopefully, um, recurrent flight opportunities for testing um, uh, technologies and small satellites. Uh, in space uh, in a cost-effective and, as I said, uh, uh, a cost-effective way and with recurrent opportunities. So we put uh, some almost 100 million euro into into this and work together with ESA, Ariane Spas and a number of other companies to uh, achieve this, uh, hopefully, uh, in the course of the next program. Finally, a few a few words also about science and exploration, where I mentioned there is there are projects related to in scientific instrumentation, but also to data um, exploitation. So that means science, basically. So here we see then a number of those uh, projects that have been launched uh, in Horizon 2020 for in the order of 50, 54 million euro in total. Uh, one example really in the science field is uh, small bodies near and far, which <laughs> uh, established the first database of thermal infrared observations of small bodies in our solar system, just as an example. But there were a number of uh, uh, high prestige publications coming out of this, uh, including Nature. Finally, the last chapter would be on uh, secure, safe space environment. As I mentioned, work on uh, space weather, near-Earth objects, space debris mitigation, and the uh, space surveillance and tracking. The total budget is about 50, 150 million, but the vast majority of that is, uh, the 75 percent of that is devoted to the SST activity, which is run by a consortium of member states uh, that uh, establish uh, an operational activity uh, enabling us, Europe, to have a capacity to observe and catalogue uh, orbiting space objects and to uh, uh, provide collision warnings and a number of other services as well, re-entry uh, uh, warnings and so on. Uh, of course, this is still not intended to replace uh, the US system that we uh, rely on and US provides data but to be complementary to the US system and uh, to provide a certain level of, of uh, European own capacity. This is, as you saw in the first slides, also intended to continue in the next uh, research program and as a, an operational activity in its own right. Uh, we can add that 
in Horizon 2020 period, another additional 70 million was uh, uh, funded from Galileo and Copernicus programs to fund the operational SST activity. What we funded from Horizon 2020 was the research activity to improve the system. Um, okay, going back to space weather, 17 million euro, nine projects addressing these areas, as I just mentioned. So here gives the, an overview of the how the various projects uh, took place in, in the time of period. Um, I will let's skip this one. <coughs> and uh, near-Earth objects, space debris mitigation, space traffic management, and then the SST activities, as I mentioned, and the GovSatcom are mentioned on this slide. So um, I think the SST, I skip that. Uh, I th think we can skip this safely as well. Um, as I mentioned, SST pooling and enhancing existing member state capacities. You, must, you, 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 you probably already know some of you that basically what we need here are radars, ground-based radars, potentially in the future as well, space-based uh, radars or, or uh, optical sensors. Mm, but the ground-based radars are uh, in Europe uh, military assets uh, or is uh, kind of dual use civil military assets. So we need here to work together with member states and their departments of defense in order to achieve a pooling of existing such capabilities. Uh, and, uh, and there is also then, uh, of course, not so easy to run the operations. We have 106 users for the moment, and there are a number of, as you see, the collision avoidance service, re-entry analysis service, fragmentation analysis service and uh, we can really see that this activity is, is uh, uh, coming off the ground if I may use this ex expression and becoming a real a real player in the field and uh, that's why it's important and the commission is EU is committed to continue this activity and to develop it further uh, still again as I said in close cooperation with the United States uh, efforts in this area which is really uh, ma massive. Okay, that uh, concluded. I think within forty-five minutes or so, the the uh, what I wanted to cover. I think it was quite dense. Probably a lot of project-related um, information I skipped over because it takes too much, and also I don't know everything about these projects to be honest. Uh, but uh, there are, as you see there at the bottom. Uh, there is plenty of information to be found online. We have something called Cordis, which maybe Professor Lapas knows is uh, used. Didn't was was were not was not in the past a very user friendly and uh, and let's say useful um, site, but has been improved significantly. So here you find all the projects funded. Uh, you find the information and very often the final reports and several other materials on each project. So um, if some of the projects of this presentation raised your interest, don't hesitate to go there to find out more and maybe find links also to the consortium project websites and people to get in touch with. There is also the what we call funding and tenders portal. You can just Google funding and tenders. <clears throat> where Europe, all European programs, including Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, uh, information is uh, available in uh, terms of calls, upcoming calls for proposals and tenders and so on. So that's a rich source of information. Also, uh, we need experts to help us evaluate proposals and monitor and review projects. And there are calls for uh, experts for expression of interest of experts who may want to help us in this also on this funding and tenders portal. So thank you very much for your attention and for having me here. I'm available at your disposal for potential questions, discussions. So back to Vios. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you for that very uh, in-depth view of uh, the R&D projects that uh, happen with uh, do are, are funded by the Commission. Uh, this is something that is not always very visible to our students uh, and, you know, both postgraduate and undergraduate. 
uh, it's it's very important, I think, to know that uh, the EU, in addition to the European Space Agency, funds a lot of work on R&D, as you mentioned, with small, medium enterprises, universities. Uh, from the acronyms, I was able to recognize many projects that some of my colleagues have participated before uh, and are currently ongoing, like Safe Space by uh, Professor Laglis. Uh, obviously, remove debris and other ones that uh, I, I had the opportunity to work, and also high tech, which is yeah. uh, funded by the uh, by the SME calls. Uh, it, it was also very interesting to see the how the money is spent. You know the pie charts. You know where where yeah. the importance uh, goes, and um, I I I should take this opportunity then to uh, sort of open the floor to students and. Uh, Ask any questions. Uh, a lot of them are very research oriented, want to become more active researchers. So I encourage everyone uh, to uh, think of asking questions and also my colleagues uh, about potential funding opportunities, you know, because the work program is coming up and we might be able to get a few bits of uh, information legally from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, questions. From anyone about R and D and the EU. Yeah, it's usually difficult uh, to get started. Yeah. No, no. Uh, <laughs> once we get the ball rolling, I think yeah. our our class always asks uh, questions. We have Yorgos. Yorgos, do you want to ask question? Uh, hello, Mr. Mats. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear very well. Okay, thank you for coming. I I would like to ask. Uh, how does the future of the European space program compares uh, versus those of other countries like the United States and countries in East Asia? Like, sh should we expect Europe to be more independent and take a leading role in space in the next 20 maybe years? And what would you say to someone who would like to work in the field but mm -hmm. doesn't know if they should stay in Europe or maybe go in a country that looks more promising or exciting? Ah, yeah, of course. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, without any easy <laughs> answers, uh, what one of the, of course, it's uh, extremely difficult for Europe to compete uh, with the U.S., for example, uh, where uh, the the um, well, first of all, the the governmental side, if I may say, the military side, is funding a lot of these. The activities, even a lot of the new space activities, is funded by government money, um, uh, and we cannot uh, in Europe easily compete with that. We uh, uh, we also have Russia and China, where uh, which is most which are basically states the states run programs, right? So, so uh, what we have in Europe uh, is. Um, a complicated picture of uh, individual member states' own efforts. Of course, the ma majority of the efforts consolidated around the uh, European Space Agency and the European Commission's uh, providing some uh, support in specific areas, I would say. But uh, when it comes to operational services, a major player, because, I mean, after all, Galileo Copernicus are, is EU-owned infrastructure. And uh, I mean, the satellites are owned by the European Union, right? So, so uh, uh, it's operated by op various operators. It's uh, been developed by ESA with EU money and so on. So, so it's a complicated picture indeed. And, uh, and um, we try have to, in our European fashion, try to make sense of it. One of the weaknesses in Europe has always been, I mean, everybody knows, has been the, the uh, shortage of uh, risk capital and uh, therefore many small promising companies have been going over to the United States primarily then uh, for uh, access to capital to grow and this is um, this is uh, I mean I suppose this is still the situation now in Europe we try uh, ESA has their own activities we have our own activities compared to uh, sorry connected also to European Investment Bank and European Investment Fund. I mentioned it briefly in the beginning. Um, so we really try to address this uh, with some public money in order to stimulate private money, so to say, uh, to, to go here. And, uh, 
and uh, I think the SME instrument has been quite successful as well in uh, providing funding for promising SMEs um, in the space area. So I think the situation is uh, looking positive. When it comes to being independent or non-dependent, I think, I mean, space, we still need to have a lot of strong cooperation with other countries. Uh, but uh, what I mentioned there in terms of critical technologies is uh, specific areas where we need to have European access to critical technologies. I think about, of course, uh, electronics, uh, but there are major massive investments needed to manufacture electronics in Europe. Um, but uh, things like uh, atomic clocks for Galileo is a good example where we have a European uh, source, but it's Swiss Switzerland, it's not EU, but okay, it's almost, it's close to, close to us, but, uh, but uh, there are basically no other uh, sources. So, so, and there are many such examples and the quantum, are the efforts that we launched together with the European Space Agency on quantum for space is a good example where we try to learn from, uh, from, from the situation and be active and uh, to get uh, ahead, or at least uh, to be in the race for quantum in space. So I think, uh, yeah, we, we cannot rest. Of course, one, uh, also we don't have, uh, unfortunately, some Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos in Europe. Um, you know, we, we still have to rely, but you know, the situation is changing rapidly even here, I think. So, so it will be extremely interesting to see uh, how, uh, you know, the coming five, ten years, how things evolve. I don't know. That was a lengthy, lengthy answer, perhaps without or without so much content. I feel. Well, but... it, it, it covered it covered a lot of ground, and yeah. um, I, I think something that is not very well known, as you mentioned, um, Mats, and I know we were involved in this in many uh, policy discussions in uh, various groups and committees, mm -hmm. is that Europe has taken a very careful strategy to work on the non-dependence uh, aspects mm -hmm. of uh, space technologies. And it has funded some uh, very key activities uh, because there are, as you mentioned, a few activities, which technologies, which uh, Europe either has a single source, a monopoly, or uh, doesn't have a solution like it was mm -hmm. with uh, deployable antennas, antennas mm. and mesh antennas. Yeah, and you know. Uh, it, you know, I was just reading an article recently that uh, a consortium led by HPS in Germany and uh, large space structures uh, was awarded, uh, a, you know, a mesh antenna for one of the Sentinels. And mm. I think that is a massive success story. Yeah. They were funded by one of those Horizon 2020 projects that you mentioned. Yeah. And uh, they they were able, it was, a, uh, I think it was an 11 million grant, uh, and they were able to convert that into a product in competition with U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember from my Surrey days in the U.K. that the atomic clocks mm -hmm. was an issue, and I believe it still is an issue, unfortunately. And it's, it is. It's yeah. it's not an easy problem to solve, I think. Um, no, it's not. I mean, uh, uh, modern or uh, I mean, latest uh, technologies in microelectronics is also a good example, like ultra deep submicron. If we want to go there, I don't know if you know how feasible it is for space in the short term, but still, if you want to manufacture such things in Europe uh, by European controlled companies, that's investments in billions of euros. Yeah, to do that, several billions of euros. So obviously, you know, if we have a choice with our space program, we don't, we don't do that. So we, we try to find other other ways. But of course, it's important, and it's something to, uh, to to look into uh, generally for Europe. Of course, if we should not have better capacity to do that that kind of work. Yes. Uh, well, I know you're you're tired, uh, Mats, as well, and we've had a number of lectures. So I just wanted to see in the audience if there's any a few more questions, short questions for Mats uh, from colleagues or students. Uh, we talk a lot about research. Costis. Uh, yes. Hello. Could I also have a pick your brain if uh, if I can? So. Uh, if uh, some of us have, uh, you know, an idea to, to do something, would you say or would you suggest it would be better to go uh, via the academic uh, slash research route 
or try to, uh, you know, commercialize it uh, right away. Like try to set up uh, a business and uh, and uh, you know try to get funding for it. What uh, what do you see from your experience uh, being more successful? Or I, I guess it it can always be a combination of the two, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. I think you are on different. Uh, depends. Uh, if this is a new technology that needs to advance uh, from TRL uh, two three up to TRL five, so that's clearly a research project thing. Uh, if you want to, if you need the last step to TRL seven eight uh, to be space qualified and so on then uh, then uh, we could perhaps help with in orbit demonstration validation opportunity but but that uh, would probably come at some kind of cost uh, for, for hopefully uh, cost effective but still um, and there you would need capital risk capital or something like that i suppose but uh, there are many opportunities i think it's uh, it's research is good. It's I mean research route is good. It's very competitive. It's not easy to get funds, um, uh, and and but of course when you get to a certain level near the market, you need to to move to other other source of funding sources of funding, uh, private private investments, uh, maybe loans. Um, uh, so the the European uh, investment bank investment fund. Uh, or other, I mean, private venture capital supported by European investment fund could could help. Hopefully, um, we don't. Sadly, we don't have an SME instrument um, the way we had it in Horizon 2020. But there is something similar called, I think, accelerator grant or something under the European Innovation Council. Still, still partially under Horizon Europe, partially under something called Invest EU, which is another program. Where you would also be able to to find funding more for, for uh, you know a more commercial market near activities. So uh, again, uh, depends where you are on the TRL scale, perhaps. But uh, you know, I would say even if I come from research domain myself originally, if you can find uh, private capital and go for uh, product d development and find the customers, of course, that's the way to go. Now. You may still want to do research activities for your next for your next generation product, clearly, but uh, well, it's no easy answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. Thank you very much. Though. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Can I ask a question? Yes. Ah, ah thanks. Uh, so uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Lundqvist. Uh, so you showed the slide where uh, onboard software was quite underrepresented at uh, something like 2% uh, of uh, funded projects. And I'm wondering why that is. Uh, do you consider software as, I don't know, an integral part of uh, all activities and therefore do not fund it separately? Or uh, why is that? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not able to answer really. I think uh, in terms of critical technologies, uh, software related issues, uh, software related technologies were were added only quite recently. So that might be one reason. Um, we, I think, uh, I don't know. I don't know to be honest uh, why this is, but we have had very little activity on software development or software development environments and so on but of course it's an integral part of the space system so so uh, yeah something to look into but it is on the current uh, list of critical space technologies uh, prepared by this joint task force as i know at least some some like automatic code generation for example when it comes to AI systems and things like that, uh, we don't develop the software in the space program. I don't think this is, you know, the software for AI is developed in the ICT program rather, or, you know, elsewhere in the US or in private, but uh, not in this. We, don't have, we haven't had any call, calls on this in this area specifically, although we have calls for AI 
to be applied for Earth observation, uh, for example, there's a was a big call in 2020 for the, for that uh, on the space program, uh, space research horizon 2020. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, um, I I wanted to ask one last question, uh, Max, which is quite simple and, and straightforward, and perhaps is a good idea to use it to close our session, which is. You've been working on EU programs uh, for a while and for space. Um, if you were to pick a funding stream that you think made the most significant impact, which which kind of structural tool do you think uh, worked very well? Is there, you know, like there was the space, the, the, the research clusters, which was a new thing that was used. Uh, there was the SME call. Um, there were th there's a number of schemes. Which which scheme mm. do you think worked best? Uh, if 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 you're able to comment on it, because it might be still very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy question. One can find successful projects, of course, a little bit everywhere, and also less successful projects a little bit everywhere. But uh, but I think. Um, I, in my experience, um, best value for money probably is in the smaller projects, I think. I mean, remove debris is a good example where finally, uh, I think it was 7 million in total, including the launch and two CubeSats, right? So, so, um, and the development of the of the platform and so on. So, so of course, some of it was background knowledge, but still, it was really, really cost effective and successful in the end. Um, <clears throat> I think several SME instrument projects have been very good, not very expensive, but uh, and and very good results. Deorbit is one where there is this deorbiting solution for uh, satellites, um, so they don't become space debris. So, so. It's difficult. I think, I mean, from my previous life in DG Connect, I mean, what is now called DG Connect, there was a very successful activity of, which costed less than a few million, I think, uh, which was basically to bring in the newly, ex, newly acceded countries, so Czech Republic and so on, Poland, who just became members. And it turns out that if a, few, a small project of 100 million or so, or even less, was extremely successful in setting up or maintaining a research group in one of those universities in the eastern countries, which would otherwise have been disbanded because of lack of funding. And they are now uh, world leading in their field. So it's uh, it's not in space, huh? but it's quite interesting how very small amount of money, relatively speaking, at the right time can be extremely useful, extremely impactful. Um, but um, no, I don't know. I know. Oh, the, the instruments we have uh, are uh, generally grants and grants to consortia consisting of uh, three to seven or even more members. And there's an, a certain type of project which lends itself very well for, to that, I think. I mean, especially certainly low TRL, mid TRL. When you come to higher TRL levels and uh, closer to market, maybe the grant system is not perfect because you force people to work together while they are maybe competing actually mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you also our grant system even if it has improved is a little bit slow in terms of uh, the time you have to wait until you be between you submit your proposal until you get funded uh, it used to take a year or one and a half year now it takes eight months so it's a bit better but still uh, too slow f if you're close to a very dynamic market situation. So, uh, yeah. That's I think what we need, a diversity of uh, instruments, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. Well, Max, I wanted on behalf of my colleagues and our students to thank you very much for taking the time at this very busy, busy uh, period <laughs> of the year for the commission to talk to us about R&D. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to work with you and it was really good to be able to pick up your experience and your brains from working on all these programs. So again, thank you so much. And, thank you uh, very much we'll, for having me. We'll speak me, soon, yeah. very, very yeah. soon. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for having me and have a good uh, good evening, all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.